So as it was announced on the website, the topic of our first lecture is Understanding Health, the Intersection of Psychology and Spirituality. So I will be covering several topics today and at the end I will actually write them down and put them on the website so that you can from everything that you hear you can summarize for yourself what are the main themes that we have been looking at today. But the first topic under understanding health is I want us to reflect on the question why we ail. I've been personally moved to start this community group as a clinician, psychotherapist, and lifelong educator in recognition of the debilitating absence of a systemic psychospiritual education and understanding in people's lives. It is striking to me how much we truly do not have systemic psychospiritual education that helps people think about their lives and envision their experience. This debilitating lack results in rapidly mounting rates of anxiety, depression, and relational distress worldwide. In fact, since the year 2000, the World Health Organization has been referring to this modern condition as the social breakdown syndrome globally. And we are currently in the decade of global mental health because it has become apparent that global mental health is right now a much more serious issue than even infectious diseases or other uh, health issues. The hope, of course, is to find systemic solutions, but so far, and the decade of mental health extends until 2020, we haven't seen that emerge yet and hence the extreme importance and urgency of this conversation. It is my observation that much of what I see clinically every day has to do with our difficulty understanding who we are, what is the source of our health, and how we can strengthen our health and well-being in the midst of deepening social maladies. We are surrounded by unprecedented pervasiveness of stereotypes on every level in our lives. Stereotypes that readily define everything from personal happiness and parenting to professional accomplishment and social life. Yet they simply do not deliver. We are inundated with information and increasingly challenged to differentiate truth and reality from competing ideologies and claims. So the goal of these structured talk series is to address systematically these issues and open up a careful exploration in our small group discussions. So again, the goal is to approach this issue as systematically as we can. I'm an adult developmental psychologist whose work for the past 25 years has been informed by a Baha'i spiritual perspective, which I personally discovered during my doctoral work in my early 30s. I was surprised at that time at how comprehensive an understanding this spiritual perspective offered and how little it was known and drawn upon in the social sciences and helping profession. Of course, there's really no surprise in that, because very similarly, until the late 1960s, the wealth of insights of Buddhist psychology was practically unknown in the West. And people had a dim view of what these seemingly exotic Far Asian spiritual practices of sitting cross-legged with eyes closed for extended periods of time were all about. It took some decades of pioneering work to translate the insights of Buddhist psychology into the language and practical needs of Western people. And today, mindfulness practices and research are generally recognized as foremost frontiers of opportunities for better living. 
So apparently this is what it takes with each new spiritual paradigm. And so in the past 25 years of scholarship, publications, teaching and psychotherapeutic work accompanying people towards health, I have woven the insights of the Baha'i spiritual perspective with emergent scientific discoveries and have been able to develop a much more comprehensive understanding of health in a global age than graduate school actually gave me. So, as I listen, is the door open? Please come in, come and join us. As I listen to people describe their experience of unhealth and the ways in which they struggle with life, I hear this common theme. We don't know what is living us. We don't know what is living us. We often feel estranged from our physical bodies and their symptoms and over rely on medications to control our symptoms which we don't really understand. We feel insecure, always trying to do a little more, be a little more, achieve a little more to somehow stay ahead of an emptiness and uncertainty within. We are tired, but we often can't sleep or rest, so we lean on alcohol to unwind. We love our children, but we are not sure just exactly how to help them feel strong and secure and purposeful in their lives, so that they don't, so that they don't just reproduce our own lostness. When teenage hits, many of us feel helpless as parents. We love our friends and family, but often our interactions are so unsatisfying and ridden with tensions that we wonder what that's about. Of course, during the holiday season is when I get the most phone calls from people. All kinds of people will contact me in late December, on the 31st of December. <laughs> it, apparently, we all long for the same things, but we really have a hard time receiving what we need. We want to use our skills to do something good in the world, but we sense that many of the organizations we work for are fundamentally self-serving and human beings don't really count. We feel disconnected, but we don't even know where to begin to connect. We lose ourselves in automatic thinking. Which Michael Singer, one of the authors actually quoted on the IONS website of resources, calls the inner roommate. Do you know that you have an inner roommate that's <coughs> always talking to you? And of course, the question that this book opens up is, well, if the inner, inner roommate is actually you, then you must already know everything the inner roommate is telling you before it's actually spoken. <laughs> so what is the purpose of this mental chatter? What is really going on? We have cultivated sophisticated outer forms of knowledge in modern society and have come to depend on them so much that the inner has been lost. In our joy and pride in what we have been able to create, we have lost sight of a noble spirit, severed ourselves from our roots and become these free-floating identities with little center or ground, oftentimes disconnected individuals. Our self-definitions are typically disconnected from our deeper intuitions. So we live at the very tip of an iceberg and we experience a pre-conscious incoherence 
expressing all kinds of inner tensions and anxieties. These inner tensions and anxieties have thousands of different faces, but they all boil down to the same realities, to the same patterns. And people try to assuage these inner tensions and anxieties in all kinds of ways, serious relationships, lots of sex, um, various substances, compulsive shopping, achievement, uh, the next fad, all kinds of things. But we only become more and more stressed. No matter how much we meditate, exercise, eat well, and try to collaborate with like-minded people, something is still missing. For me personally, it gets poetically captured in the language of the fire tablet from which I'm going to read just a few lines so you can experience the spiritual poetry that particularly speaks to me about this condition. In the name of God, the most ancient, the most great. Indeed, the hearts of the sincere are consumed in the fire of separation. Where is the gleaming of the light of thy countenance, O beloved of the worlds? Those who are near unto thee have been abandoned in the darkness of desolation. Where is the shining of the morn of thy reunion, O desire of the worlds? This is part of a much longer piece. It may remind some of you of Rumi, because it has similar geographic sources. In any case, I will stop here with the question, why we ail, and turn to the question of human nature and the power of language to define our reality. What are we? We cannot really know what's living us if we don't know what we are. We cannot know what healthy living is if we don't know what we are. So there's all kinds of suggestions out there about what we are. Fundamentally flawed, sinners, inadequate or full of potentiality and on this plane to learn to make choices which actualize these potentialities. Consumers or beings whose spirit is forever drawn to transcend its current condition as it aspires towards deeper understanding of reality, towards more beauty in life, towards more goodness and love. Souls that thrive on their connections to others. Friends, language is internalized from our first moment on this plane. That means in utero. It scaffolds our experience of ourselves and life. The languages that we internalize scaffold our thinking. For a long time, as you realize, we have no choice what languages we're going to be exposed to. But sooner or later, we have the option to become aware of the languages that are shaping us and to take a step towards carefully choosing the languages we internalize and that we lean on to describe our experience. That is a profound aspect of human awareness, freedom and health, which is very rarely spoken about. So what are the languages that shape our experience of ourselves, at least the most dominant floating languages? Materialist explanations of human reality as defined by its animal nature. Science tells us that we are essentially animals 
who create complex social systems and cultures, but are ultimately about self-interest. Altruistic motives and our long history of cooperation to create societies somehow remain unaccounted for. Religious interpretations of original sin, the inner battle of good and evil, and salvation through divine redemption have left many of us, religious or not, with this sense that we are fundamentally flawed. Social <coughs> messaging emphasizes appearances and getting ahead. And despite the inspirational language of democracies about human rights and dignity, we all can see that our democracies are deeply corrupt and serve special interests a lot more than humanity. Something in the languages and narratives that define us feels fundamentally limiting, fragmented, and disheartening. That is why a growing number of people seek the intersection between science and spirituality and are interested in the nature and capabilities of human consciousness. Spiritual language is emergent. It seeks to find the point of reference in the individual soul and in its relationship to life. Lots of interesting developments in this direction are out there. We have here Reiki practitioners, we have people who are trained in energy medicine, we have a range of people who have interests and do work in consciousness from different angles and different spiritual perspectives. Of, clo of course, that includes the work of IONS, women's movement, the environmental movement. There are many corners, if you look carefully at the comprehensive picture of the globe, from which spiritual language and understanding are emergent and are converging. Yet, a coherent language that addresses the whole is not yet readily available. And what is difficult is as we try to cross, uh, across actually these different segments of knowledge and different languages, there's the language of conventional medicine, there's the language of alternative medicine and energy medicine, there's the language of psychology as a science, uh, then there's the language of consciousness studies that even though they're fundamentally psychological are not recognized as part of psychology, uh, and then there's the language of each wisdom tradition and they all sound so different and make such seemingly competing claims, seemingly. So what we are really looking for and needing to make sense of our actual lived experience is a spiritual language that speaks to mind, body, spirit in a social context. <clears throat> so ever since the 60s, we heard a significant movement towards a holistic understanding of the human being, but how holistic was framed was mind, body, spirit. What has been lost of sight is the social context and the power of language, as I just spoke, that really shapes our experience. Because we're just not recipients of a social context, we are co-creators of it. So until we have a language that speaks meaningfully to that whole, we continue to feel, in varying degrees, lost and fragmented. And so with this, I'll move to my third little sub-theme tonight, which is language as a holding environment. development, I came to appreciate that all life is motion, the motion of becoming, and that for, for human beings, that motion is about meaning making, about creating increasingly more comprehensive meaning of who we are vis-a-vis -vis our experience with others, meaning that sustains us in the forward motion of living. So, thank you. Language as a holding environment. 
In this forward motion of living and meaning making as human beings in progressively more comprehensive and encompassing ways, which is the motion of human life, we actually are experiencing a broken relationship to meaning right now. I'll say it again. Even as the forward motion of human life is all about meaning making, what we're currently experiencing now is a broken relationship to meaning. Meaning used to be defined in a human life by participation in the particular languages of local tradition. Since the mid-19th century, we've been questioning and deconstructing many of these traditions, both personal family traditions, cultural and religious traditions, as interpreted by clergy. The unexpected effect of that liberating process has been the Tower of Babel. The emergence of so many different languages that shape our experience and that are so mutually incoherent, contradictory, and piecemeal that they don't really help us see our place in the big picture anymore. That's why, despite the vast knowledge about human brain and behavior accumulated over the past hundred years, we experience rapidly mounting emotional and psychological disturbances across our rapidly changing global world, making possible in an age of global education, information and know-how, everything from child and human trafficking to genocides to the knowing depletion of planetary resources on a perilous scale. So, critical to the forward motion of life are holding environments. And holding environments are a fundamental concept in psychology. These are environments which both are there for us, yet also challenge us, and very importantly, remain in place as we change. So many of us are unfortunately quickly losing our holding environments, connections with family and friends, not to mention communities, in our highly dynamic lives are breaking down rather rapidly as we keep redefining our sense of self and other. And so we are asking ourselves and looking around to see what actually holds us. Language, friends, can be a holding environment. That's something I discovered at the age of 33 when I read the following ex excerpt from Baha'u'llah Seven Valleys. Dost thou think thyself only a puny form when within thee the whole universe is folded? Turn thy sight unto thyself that thou mayest see me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self-subsisting. When I first read this language at the age of 33, I had just come out of communism at the age of 30. I had no meaningful relationship to any kind of spiritual tradition, even though I was raised in a, in a Christian Eastern Orthodox tradition. And I really could not even begin to understand <laughs> what this was telling me. But I did know that it hit the spot. It felt right. I didn't know why. This was actually written in the middle of the 19th century. 
This language of the Baha'i Dispensation, which unfolded over three stages in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, and beyond that, framed on a whole new level of understanding the nobility and potentiality <coughs> of the individual soul, and that was something that was articulated in a series of writings in the 1850s, the nobility and potentiality of the human soul. In the 1860s, it began to articulate the nature and baggage of historical man with all of our loads of prejudices and rootedness, both wonderful and, and very hindering. <laughs> and then in the 1870s and beyond, it began to dis describe and articulate the dynamics of universal human beings. So this emerging new language which continues the implicit wisdom of earlier spiritual traditions, frames human experience with a comprehensiveness and rational coherence, which we will have an opportunity to explore, at least to the extent to which I engage it in my talks and to the extent to which you find it meaningful or interesting. It speaks directly, systematically and comprehensively, but also poetically uplifts the soul. About a hundred years later, the self-actualization movement began in the West, and people began to move away from either or dualistic dichotomies, black and white, truth, untruth, sinful, saved, to a more unitary understanding of human nature. At the same time, quantum physics was also being born, and with it, a holographic understanding of the universe, which we associate with many people, actually, but the name that's most recognizable is physicist <coughs> David Bohm. What does a holographic understanding of the universe mean? Uh, it means that a holon, which is a part of the holography, is understood to be both a part of the whole and also containing the blueprint of the whole. Now that's profound. People began to also talk about light and the absence of it in a wide new range of ways. Now let's listen with all of these later developments in mind to the words that I quoted earlier and see from a holographic perspective, what these words suggested to humanity in the middle of the 19th century. Dost thou think thyself only a puny form, when within thee the whole universe is folded? Turn thy sight unto thyself, that thou mayest see me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self-subsisting. Clearly, when we think of ourselves as a lot more than conditioned behaviors, genes, and a fragile, finite body, or the firing of neurons in a social animal, when we understand our individual consciousness as a holon in a holographic universe, the limitations we experience are lifted and our experience begins to change. We realize that there are four levels of our experience at least, material, embodied, intellectual, social, and spiritual. And that our education for each of these levels of our experience needs to be commensurate with the others. Then we begin to understand ourselves. Then and only then do we begin to understand ourselves in coherent ways we begin to find ground as we understand how the embodied relates to the intellectual, to mind, how that relates to spirit, 
and how that relates to society and our social contexts. The more we understand that, the more grounded we feel, the more we're able to identify an individual purpose in our lives, we begin to recognize and cultivate our relatedness to others, we connect to our roots, as we also connect to our forward motion. In summary, friends, the experience of health has to do with coherence of meaning on the material and embodied intellectual, social, and spiritual levels of our experience. Such coherence of meaning is communicated both energetically and as waves throughout the chemistry of the whole person, affecting the state of brain, heart, and body, not to mention behavior. We will discuss these things much more in subsequent lectures when I'll go into much more detail on findings on mind, heart, mind, heart coherence, and all of these holding environments and all of these central concepts that were introduced today. But for now, I'd like to close today's lecture with a chart, which will take me a little bit of time to construct as we speak. And after that, I'm going to invite all of you to break into small groups and begin to process what you've heard so far from the point of view of your own understanding and perspectives. So, in this chart, I'm going to capture, well, I'm not going to capture, I'm going to try to capture, I'm going to feebly attempt to try to capture um, a way to think about the four aspects of our reality and our progressive embodiment around the activation of genes and social conditioning the formation of personhood, then the evolution of personhood. And I will differentiate between soul, personality, identity and narratives, mind, and language. So let's see how we can accomplish that together. That at the very core of life, at the very core of being, there is unknowable spirit. We have different names for that, uh, different traditions describe and define it a little differently, but we keep coming back to this reality of a noble spirit, and you will notice I will write it in yellow because it's practically invisible. So you know something is there, but you really <laughs> don't know what exactly is there. So here we go. Out of this unknowable spirit, there appears to emanate the reality of the individual soul. And this reality I'm going to capture in green, which is closest to the color of light, to yellow, but is embodied so you can actually see it. Now, there's lots of very interesting research that is increasingly suggesting that the soul, this entity which has been forever referred to in wisdom traditions, uh, is, appears to be some kind of energetic configuration that comes into existence, it comes into uh, separate existence at the moment of conception. And there's interesting research in uh, prenatal experiences recollected by very, very young children that in some cases are able to describe the moment of conception, efforts at abortion in the first trimester, striking, striking things, including experiences of the mother in the first trimester. And these things are usually published as vertical data only when... Um, it has been verified that they could not be secondhand information. And if you're interested, I will give you the source of this uh, uh, <coughs> material. Uh, 
In any case, apparently there is some kind of energetic emanation from a knowable essence that is the beginning of our existence, at least according to these studies that I have read at the point of conception. Now, we have different beliefs around that, and we can have different conversations around that, and that's really fine. I'm just sharing what I understand and know at this point. <coughs> From that moment on, embodiment begins. Genes are activated, social conditioning begins to be layered, brain and nervous system begin to form and around the reality of the soul begins to take shape the structure of a person okay and so we see the structure of a person emerging <coughs> and this structure is a layering which begins certainly in utero and continues throughout life because our social conditioning is not just in childhood, it continues for as long as we are around. There's also language and the impact of language which is part of this conditioning and so we form a structure around this center, which I'm going to refer to as soul, or also our spiritual intelligence. So you can tell I'm not much of an artist. This is already getting cluttered and uh, is, is not very visually appealing, but that's my best. We all have our strengths somewhere. <laughs> so I'm sure people can do better uh, on this. Okay, so this structure begins to take shape. And this structure, of course, is taking shape in contexts. It is not taking shape alone, hanging in the unknown. It is rooted in contexts. The most immediate context, of course, is family. The first holding environment, the primary caregiver, and the family around them. The nuclear family, the extended family. But of course, there is also the context of the culture and rootedness of that family. So that's the generations that went before and their intergenerational experience, knowledge, wisdom, way of seeing and understanding life, all of that is transmitted in all kinds of ways, activating genetic uh, the genetic material of this little embodiment and layering it with all kinds of ways of thinking and feeling and seeing the world. Then there's also the context of language. There's a lot of research that shows that bilingual children seem to be at an advantage developmentally because Language is a different system of thought. Each language is a different system of thought. And when children are exposed from early on to two different languages, understand two different ways of thinking that they have to shift back and forth uh, between, obviously their cognitive capacities and their <coughs> ability to understand the relativity of systems of thought really advances. So language or languages are another set of context here. Then there's also the history of the times. It's one thing, of course, <coughs> to be born in the middle of the 19th century and another thing to be born in the 21st century in terms of the context of what you're experiencing and what your parents and your environment is experiencing that you're picking up through your nervous system every day. It's a radically different experience. Then we're talking about the social and cultural tensions of the time. That's yet another context. These are all contexts that are shaping and interacting with this forming human being. Okay? And so, mind develops. Next lecture will be dedicated to the nature of mind. There is a lot of remarkable research that is coming out very, very recently on the nature of mind, which for the first time is beginning to describe mind as a lot more than the firing of neurons in the brain. 
mind is increasingly becoming understood as a embodied, not in scope, embodied and relational process, not a thing, regulating the flow of energy and information. So this understanding of mind is coming closer and closer to the understanding of spiritual traditions that mind is in fact the power of the soul. That is a profound proposition. Mind as the power of the soul. So mind is in fact the spiritual power, which is what this definition is talking about. Regula a process regulating the flow of energy and information. And I'll go into that more next time. So mind is a spiritual power. But how this spiritual power is shaped and used is critical. The spiritual power can be shaped and used in such a way that it can destroy this planet by playing with bigger or smaller buttons or it can light up this planet by the same kind of energy atomic energy which is discovered by the spiritual power so when we think about mind as the power of the spirit we then realize that how we treat the formation of mind, the education of mind in ourselves, in our children, is a far more responsible and significant affair than this um, brushing with information that we consider much of the educational process. And so we understand that if, if we have not been educated to understand and really construct our own minds throughout the lifespan with choice, which we can <coughs> as adults, if we don't have that understanding, that psycho-spiritual understanding, that kind of ownership, that sense of free will, we are going to wonder what is living us, as we do. Because the impacts on us are very intense and we really don't understand our own resources. Okay, so the formation of mind. Of course, invisible spirit penetrates, permeates all of this. It's everywhere, so I'm going to draw on top of it, and it doesn't really matter. Okay, but this layering can also be seen chronologically. You can see these as stages in development. You can see in utero development, 0 to 18 months, 18 months to 3 years, 3 to 6, 7, excuse me, the Oedipal period, then 7 to 11, then we've got teenage, and then we go into early adulthood, middle and late adulthood, and the formations of mind and personhood continue to evolve. So some of you have seen me draw this picture in this way. So this structure that has now become a person looks a little bit like this iceberg. And this is the tip of the iceberg. And typically, this is the line of awareness. And what you notice is that I drew this line of awareness as a firm, uninterrupted line. For most of us, by the time we enter early adulthood and form our sense of identity, we have become adequately disconnected from our spiritual intelligence from all the deeper processes that have happened, formative processes that have happened, from our rootedness, we don't really know our relationship to many of the contexts that we talked about and holding environments. And so, especially in the modern Western world, what I see very often, you heard me say it before, is these floating identities, free-floating <laughs> identities, tips of the iceberg, kind of bumping against each other and wondering what is really happening. Why do we feel so unstable, so alone? 
Why are we engaged in serial relationships? Why does nothing hold? Why do I have these great job, great life, great living arrangements and everything, but my life is blah and I don't understand what's ailing me? Okay, there is that disconnect. Of course, when people feel disconnected enough, anxious enough, can't sleep enough, enough st stomach ache, enough relational distress, or more serious conditions, they eventually begin to ask the hard questions. And when the hard questions start being asked, whether people find a spiritual practice and begin to meditate and reflect, and or they also seek therapy, or they seek some kind of reflection, this path of reflection and self-understanding, this line of awareness begins to become punctuated and with psycho-spiritual work, it has the opportunity to drop deeper and deeper. And while it can never un integrate the whole of consciousness, because consciousness is such a complex structure, um, our ability to integrate much greater parts of our consciousness into our conscious awareness and understanding leaves us feeling far more empowered, including in the midst of hardship and trials and tribulations, far better under understanding our lives, and therefore able to draw on our own resources and support systems. So in a sense, this is a path of integration, and in the course of these lectures, so your typical condition of an ordinary functioning Western adult is the condition of a split between their sense of identity and the rest of their being. And that split is experienced as all kinds of tensions here that I spoke about early on in this lecture. As the process of psycho-spiritual education begins and advances, the split is no longer a split because we are, uh, our awareness becomes more permeable and begins to allow more material and to process more material. We see the process of integration advancing and in the field of health, we understand integration to be the fundamental process of becoming healthier. Okay, so the opposite of integration is fragmentation. And you can think of how fragmented our lives are, how environments, how fragmented our environments are, how fragmented our languages are, <coughs> our relationships are. So the opposite of fragmentation, which is really the, the kind of the core reason for unhealth, is integration, which is the path towards health. So, as I said, Next time, we will go much deeper into the nature of mind and how these processes actually can be understood scientifically. This is just the big picture. I will close by saying that as any claims about a human being, this one here is a very, very inadequate picture because it is static and it doesn't show you the motion of becoming. Um, and life is about the motion of becoming, and a human being is about the motion of becoming. So now, as in order to make things even more uh, messy, I'll actually overlay another picture on top of this that does capture the motion of becoming. You can think of the spiral of, of human, well, you can think of the motion of human life as a developmental spiral, which has two big loops and within these two big loops there are four or five internal loops in each of the smaller loops. So in developmental psychology we think about the successful life as the life in which a person continues to grow and develop till the last breath. We now know from neuroscience 
that the neuroplasticity of the adult brain is enormous. Our ability to learn, to grow, and to develop throughout the lifespan is unquestioned. But many of us, in fact, become stuck. And that's another way to describe illness and dysfunction. So when you think about the spiral of successful lifespan development, you've got the first part of this spiral, which is ego formation, and the second part of this spiral, which is ego transcendence. Now, ego formation is essential because ego is the organizer of human experience. When we are first brought into this realm, we are inundated by stimulation that we have to somehow selectively organize, process, digest. Essentially, that's the formation of the ego, the things that we select for, the things that we do not register, the structures of self that that takes, all that other complicated stuff that I tried to draw below. But ego formation very quickly also begins to be experienced as a barrier. And so interestingly, life is much more meaningful and much more expansive when parallel with the process of ego formation, we begin to intuit and hopefully are encouraged by the languages around us that we are a lot more than that and that we need to remain connected to what else we are and to cultivate that connection as souls connected to other souls, to a spiritual universe which has its own laws and relationships. It is perfectly possible to go through the spiral of ego formation with proper spiritual education and to really ameliorate it. What happens is in the lack of spiritual, in the absence of spiritual education, people will get really stuck in this place. This is the majority of my clientele, mm -hmm. okay, right here. Well-formed egos, clearly established identities, localized in the social, cultural, public missing, a lot is unsatisfying, but by God, holding tight. It's very difficult when you have had practically no language of spiritual understanding up to this point to start letting go here. So oftentimes what happens is this kind of letting go is propelled by severe crisis, severe losses, severe illness, I mean just really hard things in life, really hard things in life. And that is sad, but it's a reality because what we provide for ourselves and for each other right now is so inadequate that we get very prone to stuckness in this place. That's the role of spiritual, psycho-spiritual education from the beginning. But there's also a lot of good developmental research that shows that at the point at which a person is fully formed, they are already, even in the absence of any language around them, <coughs> intuiting the need to self-transcend. Self-transcendence is the natural next step of full formation of the individual, full individuation. Self-transcendence is the natural forward motion. Such is the structure of life. Apparently, there's those greater forces that we try to convey in this color that are part of the interconnectedness of a very meaningful universe which has a motion, has a purpose, has a direction, and these are things that have to be grasped, they have to be understood, they have to be spoken, they have to be explored so that we are not <clears throat> illiterate in this realm and so we're very well educated in our embodiment and in our gadgets. So, <laughs> with that, I think I'll stop and thank you very much for uh, being so receptive this evening.